Welcome to The Feast Life, where we empower you, the modern homeschool mom, to create a life and homeschool you love. One founded on faith, family, freedom, and fun. I'm your host, Julie Ross, creator of the award-winning homeschool curriculum, A Gentle Feast, and a certified Christian life coach. For more information on today's episode and to access my free gift for you, check out thefeastlife.me. Charlotte Mason once said, life should be all living, not a mere tedious passing of time. So on this show, we seek to savor the feast of life. Girl, grab your favorite beverage and pull up a chair. You are welcome at this table. life. I'm your host, Julie Ross. And as we prepare for a new year, I want to talk to you today about one of the most important tools to have in your toolbox to totally transform who you become and what you do and what you get to experience in this new year. The great thing about this tool is it's totally free. The bad news about this tool is it is a process and it requires some mental effort on your part. So what in the world am I even talking about? Today I want to talk to you about the tool of taking your thoughts captive. I have seen in my own life the greatest changes in the past couple years from changing the way that I think. It sounds really simplistic. But honestly, y'all, I didn't even know what I was thinking. I knew I had a lot of feelings that I didn't like. I knew I wanted to change the way I was showing up every day, but I didn't really know how to do that. I was so focused on changing my outward circumstances, changing other people, changing my behavior and actions, changing these feelings, beating myself up for having these negative feelings, And it never, ever, ever, ever occurred to me that those feelings and those actions and those results that I was getting in my life that I didn't want were all a result of my thinking. Our thoughts are so powerful. And so I'm going to kind of walk you through that today and hopefully give you some practical steps that will help you as you move forward into this new year that you can kind of see the value of taking your thoughts captive and you can have some processes to help you with that. So for a moment, ask yourself if you've ever had these thoughts, we are so far behind. My child is so difficult. Homeschooling shouldn't be this hard. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm failing my kids. I'm ruining my relationship with my children. My child isn't working up to their potential. I am totally disorganized. I am such a hot mess. I am so overwhelmed and exhausted. Do you ever have thoughts like that? I know I sure did and I know I still do at times. How do those thoughts make you feel? As I read through that list, I got like a little pit in my stomach. It made me feel really icky. It makes me feel discouraged. It makes me feel shame. Sometimes it makes me feel angry, right? All these kind of emotions that we get from thinking those thoughts. The thing is, most of us don't even know the thoughts that we're thinking on a regular basis. We're so focused on just doing, 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 and busy, 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 and the results, and trying to control our children, and control our environment, and come up with a perfect homeschool plan that we don't even allow ourselves the ability to pause and reflect. And it's so key that you do that. And as you do that, you may realize you think a lot more of those thoughts than you actually first realized. Our brains run on autopilot. So most of our thinking is the thoughts that we've always thought. The 2005 National Science Foundation study found that we have between 12,000 and 60,000 thoughts per day. And out of those thoughts, 85% of them are negative and 90% are repetitive. Why is that? 
why do we have so, so many negative thoughts, especially compared to positive ones? And why are so many of our thoughts 90% repetitive? Well, that's because it goes back to how our brains are structured. So first of all, our brains are wired to keep us safe, right? And that is a survival instinct that's so important, right? We automatically are searching for danger, for what's wrong. And so our brains tend to automatically go to what is negative in order to keep us safe. And as we develop those patterns throughout our lives, they become more and more ruts, if you will, in our minds. Those neural pathways become stronger and stronger. And according to neuroscience, there's a law called Hebron's law. And basically it is that neurons that fire together, wire together. The more that you think something, the stronger that neural pathway becomes and the easier it is for your brain to think that thought in the future. Think about it like if you're trying to clear a path in the forest, right? At first it's gonna be super hard, super difficult. You're gonna to have to work so hard. You're gonna work up a sweat. You, gotta, you might get cut by the thorns and you have to clear the branches and it's a lot of hard work. But once that path is cleared, you can just easily walk down it. And it's the same thing with our brains. So we have worked these thoughts and we're thinking them day in and day out over and over and over. And some of these you might have had your whole life. Some of these stories develop really early on in childhood. Like, I'm not good enough. I'm a failure. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have all the answers. I gotta get it perfect. We develop these stories and all of us have different ones, right? And the more that we reinforce those stories, the easier it is for our brains to kind of go down that path. So what we want to do is learn to think about our thinking. The fancy word for that is called metacognition. It's the ability to think about our thoughts. So instead of them running in, on autopilot, like the processor on your computer in the background, and we don't even notice that all the things that are running on a constant basis, we want to stop and we want to start to look at our thoughts. That might mean that we can't be constantly busy, busy, busy. It might mean we have to have breaks throughout our day where we can think about, oh, well, that situation didn't go very well. Now I'm feeling all this anger Hmm, what was I thinking about my child in that moment? What was I thinking about myself today when everything kind of went off the rails? In order for us to take our thoughts captive, and I also love the Bible verse that says, be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In order to renew our minds, we have to actually know what's in our mind. We have to actually know what our thinking is first. And I want to read you this quote from Charlotte Mason. Can we just acknowledge for a minute just how brilliant this woman was? Okay, so she lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and there was this new um, field of scientific study coming out during her time called physiology. And she was super interested in it, learned a ton about it. It was what kind of what we would call modern day psychology neuroscience. And the stuff that she says is so amazing. One, because she relates it to education and how we need to understand neuroscience in order to better educate our children. But it also really, relates to us and we need to take her words and apply them to ourselves first but now MRIs and you know brain scans and all these things that we can do now and all this research that has come out in the past decade even in neuroscience all support these things that Charlotte Mason said over a hundred years ago so it truly is remarkable so I am reading from volume one home education page 108 and she says we think as we are accustomed to thinking again that neural pathway she says, in this way, we think as we are accustomed to think. Ideas come and go and carry on a ceaseless traffic in the rut, let us call it, you have made for them in the very nerve substance of the brain. You do not deliberately intend to think these thoughts. You may indeed object strongly to the line they are taking. Two trains of thought going on at one and the same time. And objecting, you may be able to barricade the way and put up a no road sign in big letters to compel the busy populace of the brain to take another route. So again, she's using that metaphor of like a train running along train tracks. And when the tracks are laid down, when the rails are there, it's easier for the train to go down that path. So we think as we are accustomed to thinking. Sometimes we may strongly object to these thoughts. We don't like them. We're like, where did this thought even come from? Why am I thinking? I don't want to think this. Our brains go down that road that's easiest for them. And so when you first start looking at your thoughts, 
you need to give yourself grace and realize, yes, I've been thinking these things for a very long time. And don't try to judge yourself for having the thoughts. Just acknowledge, oh, yep, there was that thought. Oh, wonder what that means. And start to catch yourself thinking about your thinking. Sally Clarkson once said, and I love this metaphor, she said, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from making a nest in your hair. And it's the same thing with our thoughts. Sometimes we can't help when these negative thoughts come into our head, but we don't have to let them stay there and make a giant mess in our hair, so to speak. We don't have to feed the monster. We don't have to keep Oh, why am I thinking that? Oh, I shouldn't think that. Oh, that's such a terrible way to think. And I wonder why I'm thinking that. And then you're reinforcing that thought, right? Just by feeding that monster and beating yourself up for having even the thought, you're reinforcing it. And so Charlotte Mason makes it so simple here. We have to tell our brains that there's no road. That road is now closed. We are not going there. And I actually tell myself that when I start to have a thought that I've had before that is negative, that I don't want, that is not serving me, I say, oh, nope, we're not going down that road anymore, Julie. Dolly Parton has a quote that I love. She says, if you don't like the road you're walking down, pave another one. So if you don't like the road that your brain has been leading you with some of these negative thoughts, you have the ability to change the road that you're walking down. And I love that God made our brains neuroplastic. I love that he enables us to actually transform our minds. What an amazing blessing that is, but most of us don't even realize that we have the power to do so. We think that we're stuck thinking the same thoughts we've always thought, having the same feelings we've always had, and experiencing the same results in our lives. And I'm here to tell you that that is not true. So as we move forward to a new year, this is a great opportunity to take a look at the, some of those thoughts that are not serving you anymore and to say, no, we're not going down that road anymore. We are paving a new one. So how do we pave a new mental road? Well, it's not as easy as, you know, paving a driveway or something like that. It takes deliberate work with the deliberately take the thought captive. And I love that verse because you can kind of picture it, right? Like it, that thought's running down this one road and we're chasing after going, oh, nope, we're not going down this road anymore. We're going to go down this one. What does this new mental pathway look like? So we can let our thoughts run their course and do what they're going to do and do what they've always done. Or we can be intentional about telling our brains to think something different. So I love this quote from this theologian, Martin Lloyd-Jones. And in this verse, he's talking about Psalm 42, where the psalmist asks, why are you downcast, O my soul? And this is his response. The main trouble in this whole matter is this. We allow ourselves to talk to us instead of talking to ourself. Am I just trying to be deliberately paradoxical? Far from it. This is the very essence of wisdom in this matter. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself. Take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them, but they start talking to you. They bring back the problems of yesterday. Somebody's talking, who is talking? Yourself is talking to you. Now this man's treatment in Psalm 42 was this. Instead of allowing the self to talk to him, he starts talking to himself. Why are thou downcast, O my soul, he asks. His soul has been repressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and says, Self, listen for a moment and I will speak to you. I love this passage so, so much because there are so many just important things here. Has this ever happened to you when you wake up in the morning and you start thinking about like all the things that you're worried about that are going to come in the future and you start beating yourself up over all the things you did wrong the day before and you're like, dude, I'm not even out of bed yet. Like, where is this coming from? And then all those thoughts, they make you want to pull the covers up, right? And just stay in bed because you feel horrible. Where are those thoughts coming from? It's your own brain, right? It's giving you those negative, repetitive thoughts on a little platter. And we're going to say, nope, I'm not going to eat that today. I'm going to do something different. 
and you need to talk to yourself. You need to tell yourself what thoughts are you going to think instead. And I want you to write those out. So if there is a thought that you notice that you're thinking on a regular basis and it's not serving you and it's making you feel things you don't want to feel and it's making you take actions that you don't want to take, what do you want to think instead? And allow yourself to write that out, allow yourself to repeat it. See, what happens is when we repeat a thought over and over and over again, it becomes a belief. And when we have a belief, our brain tries to find evidence to support that belief. Okay, it's called confirmation bias. Our brains want to find evidence to support what it is that we believe. So if you have a story, you have a thought that you've been telling yourself over and over and over again, your brain will find evidence throughout the day to support that. It wants to help you. Our brains are here to help us, but sometimes they kind of malfunction and we need to help them perform a little better. So let's say you have this belief, right? That you are totally disorganized, that you're a hot mess, that you're never consistent. Throughout your day, your brain is going to show you evidence to support that belief. Oh, you forgot to call the doctor. Oh, you um, didn't turn this thing in. Oh, you can't find your kid's math book. It's gonna show you all these ways. See, you're so disorganized. And we're like, no, I want to go down a different road. So what can you believe about yourself instead? It might be too huge of a jump to believe that you're like Marie Kondo or Martha Stewart or I'm the most organized, put together person on the planet. That's very unrealistic. Your brain can't go there. So let's just like a little step up. Every day I'm growing in my ability to be organized. How does that feel? Well, that feels empowering. That feels encouraging. So then my brain is going to look for evidence throughout my day of ways that I was organized. Oh yeah, that history lesson, you had all that right there ready to go. Awesome. Oh, you remember to like pack that extra snack because you realized that you might get stuck in traffic on the way home from soccer and now your kids aren't complaining in the car because you remember that snack, way to go. Today's episode is brought to you by A Gentle Feast. A Gentle Feast offers a complete living books curriculum, an award-winning early reading program, and more tools to equip you to apply Charlotte Mason's timeless philosophy into your modern homeschool. Go to agentlefeast.com to check it out. Smooth and easy days are closer than you think. Our brains will find evidence to support whatever it is that we believe about ourselves. These self-fulfilling prophecies are so important to realize. So let me give you a little practical example from my own life. So when I was in eighth grade, I was in this like experimental math class. I don't know how I got put in it. Anyway, so what it was, was you were basically like teaching yourself advanced algebra. And we had these little books that we had to work through. And as soon as you got through with one book, you could move on to the other book. And so everybody in the class was like at different paces. And the teacher, you know, kind of kind of work with you one-on-one -on -one here and there, but like wasn't really explaining this stuff. And so needless to say, I was completely lost in this class. And one day I had asked my teacher for help and she said, Julie, do you think you're stupid? And I said, no, not particularly. And she said, why do you act that way in my class? And from that day on, I had a belief about myself that I'm bad at math. And so the next year, you know, I went in just regular math classes, stayed there my whole life in college. You know, I was an elementary education major, took elementary math classes and was like, I, and I would always just say that about myself. I'm so bad at math. And then, you know, I've been running my own business. There's lots of numbers involved. And I would always be like, oh, I don't want to have to deal with taxes. I'm so bad at math. Or I don't want to have to make a budget because I'm so bad at math. And I used that belief about myself to keep me from doing the things that I really needed to be doing in my business and in running my life and my family and our finances as well. I realized that belief was no longer serving me. Now I couldn't tell myself like, I am a financial wizard. <laughs> I am so amazing. I can do calculus in my head. Like that would have been way too big of a jump, right? 
So I realized it was no longer serving me to keep telling myself I'm bad at math because then I kept finding evidence for why I was bad at math. I was using that as an excuse to not take risks or try things in my life. And it was keeping me stuck. And so what was the next better thought? I am learning to control my finances. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. I am growing in my financial knowledge. Yeah, that feels pretty good. And so I started telling myself that story instead. Because when we have a belief about ourselves, even if we see evidence that contradicts it, here's what happens. We negate that evidence. So I had this belief that I was bad at math and one day my SAT score got mailed to my house. Back in the old days, they used to do this. And my dad saw it before I did. And he comes in, he's like, congratulations, you did so amazing, I'm so proud of you. He's like, can you believe this? Your verbal score was the same as your math score. That is so amazing. I've always told you you're good at math. And I looked at my dad and I said, wow, I must be really good at guessing. There's no way my math score is the same as my verbal score. I must have lucked out with like a really easy test or something like that because I'm bad at math. So even what I had evidence, like actual physical numbers, evidence that what I was telling myself was a lie. I negated that evidence because I, my brain couldn't see it. It was so contradictory to what I had been telling myself. And the same thing happens with us. I don't know about you, if you ever had an experience where a friend is like, oh my gosh, you're such a good mom. You and your kids get along so well. That's so wonderful. Or, oh my goodness, your kid did X, Y, Z. That's so great. You're doing such a great job. And you go, oh my goodness. <laughs> well, they might have done, they might have been like really nice at your house, but at my house, they're horrible. Or, I'm so glad they listened to you because they never listened to me. Or, oh, that was really sweet that they did it. But let me tell you the horrible thing that they did yesterday. We can't handle hearing evidence that contradicts the stories that we are telling ourselves. So we need to start telling ourselves a new story and start finding evidence to support that. That self-fulfilling prophecy is so important for you, but it's also so important for your children. I remember one day my child, she was like in fourth grade, and she was doing this long division problem and she got super frustrated and she takes the pencil and she scrapes up her whole paper and throws the pencil across the room and says, oh, I'm so bad at math. And of course I went, oh, right? Because that was something I had been telling myself forever. And I was like, oh goodness, I don't want her to believe that either. And so I went to her and, you know, I talked her through it. He said, like, dude, long division is so hard. I remember when I was your age, like I hated long division. There's so many steps and if you get like one thing wrong then the whole problem's wrong and then you have to go back through and try to figure out what step you got wrong and oh goodness it is long division is so hard can i help you let's let, let's work through this next problem and then we'll be done with math for today so we did that one problem and she figured it out and then a couple days later you know it was like okay well let's just I'll try a problem and then you try a problem and, and we'll work through this together because you know what? This is really hard, but we can do hard things and we're gonna learn from this. And she kept saying a couple of times, like, oh, I'm so bad at math. I'm like, nope, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna tell ourselves things like that, okay? You can tell yourself, I am learning how to do math or I am growing in my knowledge of long division or I don't know how to do this yet. I love the power of the word yet right? Because that has a growth mindset, which I'll talk about on another podcast episode, but just to show that there's possibility, that there's hope that you can grow in this area. It's not a black and white thinking. Well, that child is in high school now and is in geometry and they're taking a class elsewhere. I'm not teaching it. And they were telling me the other day how all the kids in the class go to her for help. She, this is the exact word she said to me. She goes, Mom, like, I just, I love my geometry class. Everybody in there, like, comes to me because they need help. And, I, like, I always know the answers. I am so good at math, was what she said. And I just had to smile because I remembered that conversation back when she was, like, in fourth grade where she thought she was bad at it. And I told her that we were not going to start telling ourselves that. And so watch the words that your kids are telling 
themselves about themselves and sometimes you don't know they keep that stuff in their head but they'll show you that frustration with their schoolwork they'll show you that anger and you can have conversations with them but in order for them to kind of embrace that growth mindset in order for them to realize that they can think differently and that's going to give them a different result in their life you have to model that first so that's why it's so key for you to start thinking about your thinking taking those thoughts captive and training yourself to go down a different road Okay, so I'm going to read to you, this is from Parents and Children, Volume 2, and this is on page 48. Charlotte Mason said, but what if from childhood they had been warned, take care of your thoughts and the rest will take care of itself. Let a thought in and it will stay. We'll come again tomorrow and the next day. We'll make a place for your, itself in your brain and we'll bring many other thoughts like itself. Your business is to look at the thoughts as they come, keep out the wrong thoughts, and let in the right. See that ye enter not into temptation. This sort of teaching is not so hard to understand as the rules for the English nominative and is of infinitely more profit in the conduct of life. It is a great safeguard to know that your reason is capable of proving any theory you allow yourself to entertain. Okay, this passage is so good. Let's break it apart, okay? So she says, again, you need to watch what thoughts you're letting in, and we don't want to enter in temptation. We want to keep out the wrong thoughts and let in the right thoughts. So again, we're not, we can't always control the thoughts that come in, so don't beat yourself up for them, but we're not going to feed them, okay? We're not going to let them make a mess in our hair. We're going to let it fly right on by. I'm not going to keep that thought. I'm going to go down a different road. And she said, it actually makes a place for yourself in your brain. And she was right, right? Science has now proven that because she said that thought if you let it stay It's gonna come back again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. It's gonna stay. <laughs> I Love this part. She's so funny. She said this is not as hard to understand as English grammar people Okay, English grammar is way more complex than what she's telling you right here about our thoughts Our reason is capable of proving any theory we allow ourselves to entertain. That's what I'm talking about here with this confirmation bias and if you read her writings about the way of the will and the way of reason, it's teaching your children about this, that our reasons, when we have a belief, and it's a thought that we say to ourselves habitually becomes a belief. Our brains are going to use reason, and I'm putting my hands in quotes here if you're listening, to prove that is right. So we want to train our reason to understand this about ourselves, to understand that we will try to prove whatever it is that we are believing about ourselves. So we're going to train our brains to start walking down another road. And if you remember how I said to do that was by telling your brain what you actually want it to think and start feeding it with the thoughts that are going to serve you. So you have to be intentional about what thoughts you are planting in your own mind. So what do you want to think? What do you want to think about yourself? What do you want to think about your homeschool? So these are some that I wrote down. I am the perfect person to homeschool my children. I am on a journey in progressing at the perfect pace. I respond with patience, trusting that all things are working for good. I am grateful to be homeschooling my children. Good things happen every day in our home. I have control over my thoughts, feelings, and energy. I will not fear because I work in cooperation with the divine teacher. Mistakes are an opportunity to learn and grow. I am becoming better each day. Those are some of the thoughts that I wrote down that I wanted to think about my homeschooling. I also have thoughts for all areas of my life. like. I am a loving, engaged mom, and I make meaningful memories with my kids. That was something that was really important to me. I am fit and active and spend a lot of time outdoors. That was another thing. What is it that you want to tell yourself? I am learning to take control of my finances. That was another one. I see miracles every day. I will see the goodness in, of the Lord in the land of the living. That's another thing I tell myself often. And you know what happens when I tell myself that? I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. What does my brain do for me? It's so helpful. It tries to find the goodness of the Lord in the land of living. It shows me more and more good things. 
So we have to be intentional about what we want our brains to think. So how do you want to show up in 2024? Not just in your homeschool, but also in life. What do you need to believe about yourself in order to show up that way? What thoughts will you need to think on a regular basis to change the road that you've been walking down? So as we approach a new year, it is the perfect time to reflect on how we've been living our life. Do we want to keep it this way? If we get to the end in 2024 and nothing has changed, what will we have lost out on? And we can set a path and be intentional about the road that we want to go down instead. If you need help with this, I am doing a three-day goal setting class. It'll be at the end of December. So if you listen to this late and you miss it, I'm also starting up another group coaching program in January called The Confident Homeschool Mom. And you can find out more about that at thefeastlife.me slash join and get on the wait list for that class. Because breaking these old thought patterns is not easy. We have long established neural pathways here, people. We have made big deep ruts in the mud of our brain. And if we want to start paving a new road, just like paving a new path in the woods, it's hard. And so having someone who can be like a coach and walk you down that process, having community to keep you accountable and support you as you're making these changes in your life is so key. So, you know, whether you join my program or not, find something that you can be a part of where you can find that community and you can find that coaching and support to help you walk this path because it is not easy, but it is possible. In just transforming your mind, these little tiny tweaks, these little tiny percentages over the course of years is going to completely change the direction that your life is headed. And I'm excited to see what is possible for you. So again, thank you for listening. And remember, life is a feast. Let's savor it. I just wanted to pop in here and thank you for listening to today's episode. I have a very special announcement. In January, I'm going to be launching a new course, The Confident Homeschool Mom, and I would love for you to join me. If you would like to get on the wait list for this course, you can go to thefeastlife.me forward slash join, and then you'll get all the information about the course when it's released and be able to get an early bird discount. So once again, that's thefeastlife.me forward slash join. I can't wait to start this in January and I hope that you'll be able to join me.